I had, um, actually it's been a little over a year now, I had a really uh, powerful um, dream, I guess. It was a dream, but it was felt much more powerful than that. Um, in that dream, I actually saw that um, the enemy would try to take my husband out, but that uh, he couldn't have him. <laughs> he couldn't take him out. He couldn't take his life. And um, then a week later, something did try to kill him, and he almost died, and then um, was basically resurrected and had a procedure, and he's doing great. Obviously, he's doing much better. But in that same dream, I was shown a setup, what the Lord was doing, and he was doing it everywhere across the globe for the Lord's people. The release of the angelic, everybody in their proper place and order. And that was really important. So what I saw was messengers of all sorts, angelic messengers, a cloud of witnesses, um, prophetic messengers, the, the Lord's voice here on the earth. I saw each messenger coming and taking their place, standing in their spot where they were uh, called by the Lord to stand, praying and prophesying and believing and moving and serving in what they were called to serve in, each one in order where they were supposed to be. And in it, I can feel my soul, and I'm seeing some of them on the front lines. And right away, I, I say, no, I, the ones on the front lines, they, they, might, they, might be, they might be harmed. How can we protect them? And I'm going into this place of sort of worry for those on the, on the front lines. And the Lord spoke to me very clearly, and he said, if they're where they're called to be, they're safe. It's where they're called to be. And I saw just how crucial, how important to be positioned to pray is going to be in this hour, in the right place, praying the right prayers, or being quiet before him. But it's a very important time. And during that time, there was a release of um, um, the archangel Michael to come and deal with chaos. This is taking place in this time frame of when all this happened. A release. The Lord had sent Michael to deal with chaos and other angelic messengers to come and to deal with situations that uh, were out of hand, to bring a, um, a peace in different situations, to deal with the chaos, and Gabriel to come and bring the revelatory message um, in this hour. I saw the Lord um, coming and bringing a word, putting a word on the lips of intercessors and prayer warriors, giving them a message that they might prophesy that message back to him. So that's what the prayer space looks like. There were cl the cloud of witnesses. Those are the cloud of witnesses, like big bouncer type messengers coming out and um, doing their role. And that was really important. And that's why this time frame now, stepping out of maybe some of the things we're not supposed to do and the prayers maybe they don't have any, there's no power behind them. And beginning to move in this place with the Lord. And what, I, what we have been sharing a lot of what the Lord is going to do is bring a message to us. Give each a message. I had an encounter in a, with Bob Jones several years ago. And he told me that each, in this, these end times, each would carry a message. They would have a message, even some one word. But it was a very complex message. It was a heavy message. There was a, um, it was necessary for the completion, for the fullness of all things. It was necessary to bring and carry their message. And that's what's going to take place in this time frame and moving in the years to come. The establishment, the, um, the recognition, the revelation is probably a better word of this message. The Lord shining a light on this thing. And some of you know your life message and some of you don't. Some of you have sent something, you've had questions, but the Lord is revealing in this time a message. And maybe we don't always know what to do with that. 
Well, what we're encouraging people is to go into that space with the Lord as you receive that message from him. Prophesy it back to him with the encouragement that he is going to hurl it back to the earth. Maybe we should read that. Is that Revelation 8? Okay, thank you. Okay, Revelation 8. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar, threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. I love the Oswald Chambers quote, prayer is not what you do before a greater work, prayer is the greater work. That's a powerful message in that one statement. And it's not praying prayers that make us sound good. And it's not praying prayers that one-up the person next to you. Who's been in a room where people were praying one-up prayers? I have way too many times, and I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> not that you guys do that. I'm saying in general, we're not going to do any of that anymore. We've been broken the Lord has continued to break up as any self that could even have been there. He's bringing us to this place of ultimate humility. That we are laid down lovers. And he's going to give us a word. And we're going to prophesy that word back to him. A word good because he put it in our heart to speak and he's going to hurl it back to the earth with fire and we're going to see the greatest outpouring the world has ever seen. Do you believe it? Well, I just had a wave where I felt the discouragement that many have felt in prayer in this last season, feeling they weren't answered. Raise your hand if that's you. And you're going, yeah, right. You want to believe it, but there's something in you going, I don't know. Well, I'm telling you, you felt the shift today, this week, and this is the time frame of the shift. Many prophetic people are prophesying this time of the door, the shift that we are in. We're moving through from one into the next room, through the door. I had a, another really powerful dream a little while back. And I saw um, an intercessor standing, actually it was an intercessor standing on a, um, like a watchtower. And they had been prophesying into the same thing for a really long time, praying for it, believing for change. And the watchtower was crumbling. That wasn't necessary anymore. And just over to the side was a door. And there was a, it was necessary to, to get over to that door and into that doorway and into the new because that old watchtower is crumbling. We're not doing it like that anymore. They're throne room prayers. And if you get into that space and you're like, I have no idea even what to pray. The Lord didn't give me a word. Then sit there. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy is he. Johnny talked about the being uncomfortable um, in the Lord, you know, drying up something to move you into something new. There may be a, a time where it's uncomfortable. I don't know how to sit here in the quiet with him for two hours. I need my iPad. <laughs> I need worship music. Well, maybe we practice getting in the secret place in the quiet space. In that place, everything changes. He tells us who we are. He tells us how he views others. But he shows us his glory. That we can prophesy this mighty move of God coming to the earth and believe for it and stir up our faith. I've missed half my notes. 
I'm going to read Isaiah 51, 16. I've put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens, found the earth, and to say to Zion, you are my people. I want to talk for just a minute about that secret place. Can I do that a couple minutes? Okay. I had another encounter, which I wrote about in my book, um, Divinely Powerful. Um, I was in the womb of the Lord. I actually was in a pretty low space. Um, anything that could try to kill me was. Ah. And the Lord showed me I was in his womb. I was in inside the Lord. The scripture says we are hidden away in God with Christ to be revealed with Christ in glory. And I was there tethered to Yeshua. That's, that's the hidden secret place. I was in the womb of understanding, receiving understanding about the time we were in, about what was necessary for a breakthrough around us. And the Lord began to speak to me about a whole bunch of different things. But one of the main things was about healing that's coming, which I won't get into. But he revealed to me what's coming. And when I came from that experience, I, I didn't want to come out of it. I was sitting there um, in this womb of understanding with the Lord. The Lord sitting propped just higher than I, barefoot, eyes like flames of fire. Tender and gentle and perfect. And I was the safest I've ever been. Comforted. I wasn't worried about all the things I was worried about before I recognized where I am hidden with Christ. Oh... Thank you, Lord. In the secret place. It's okay to go there and be quiet there. What the Lord's going to begin to do is align us with the, all the messengers, each bringing their message, each put in their place. It's going to be a cooperation with all of heaven. A grand cooperation. The angelic, like I said, the cloud of witnesses, ancient messengers. And the prophets here on the earth. Kings and priests here on the earth. Carrying a message, we begin to work together in one accord. And it starts in the prayer space, even from different homes, maybe in the same room. But we're learning to come into a place of union with him. Because you know what this, when the, when this, the world gets darker, but there's going to be a great light shining. That light is because we have come into a place of union and connection to him. And his glory light shines through us. We have to get from here where we're feeling a, a disconnect, we have to get into this place where we've come into union with him. And I can feel some of you going, I'd love that, but that feels a little far-fetched. Raise your hand if that's you, be honest. <laughs> Got a couple. But we're going to do it. The scripture tells us and they're gonna, there's going to be revelation there. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever. They're for us. He's going to reveal some mighty things in this hour. And if we're not there in the quiet space, re re receiving it from him, we're going to miss it. If we're busy doing things we need, we don't need to do. I wanted to read one more verse. 
out of Daniel chapter 10. I'm going to read actually this little um, journal entry. I don't know. We might have written it in an article. I'm not sure. But I'm going to go ahead and read it because it describes kind of this cooperation. And then we'll read from Daniel 12, 10, 12, and 13. We cannot deny the fact that God has a kingdom, a hierarchy, and host of heaven that function under his jurisdiction. God is ruler over them all. We must cooperate with heaven with the full reverential awe of God and the lamb and the blood. We see this divine interaction throughout the Bible. Gabriel and Michael are influential messengers in the bride's story. The Lord gives the archangels rule over certain circumstances, situations, and authority to watch over certain messages. So as we receive our message in this season, the Lord has angelic messengers there to watch over that message, to make sure it goes where it's supposed to go. That's a very important point. Daniel 10 is a beautiful model for effective prayer and cooperation with heaven. After 21 days of fasting, Daniel was humbled before the Lord. The Lord responded favorably to Daniel to his beckon for understanding and release the helpers from heaven. See, do you see how it works? The quiet place, receiving what the Lord has, releasing it. The Lord sends his messengers to, to do what they're, what they're called there to protect that message that it goes where it's supposed to go. He had released his helpers. Daniel 10 says this, Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. I have come in response to your words. And he will come. Can we stand and if you want to receive and just say, Lord, I want to learn. I want to pray this. There's a, this is very important to move out of where we were and into where we're going. Coming into a cooperation with the messengers of heaven. Learning a new way to pray. And it is about coming into union with him. We're hopeful for it. We long for it. We want to know him. We want to know the quiet place. We want to know him and be known by him like, like a fire knows a land we want to know. We prayed for the Holy Spirit and fire. It is his glorious love that comes and knows us, brings us into union. Lord, I pray for each person standing. I pray for the Canadian bride. I pray for those watching. I pray for, our, for each of us. I'm asking you, God, won't you teach us? Won't you teach us to be quiet before you and hear what you have to say to us? Won't you teach us to cooperate with heaven? Will you release your messengers, all kinds Will you show us the secret place? Lord, won't you shift us? We want to pray prayers that move you. We want to know what moves you. We want to yield into this new way, into this new day. Give us the courage, Lord, to yield in, to lay down the woes of the world and go up higher into the revelatory place and see what you will say. The old watchtowers crumbling, but there's an open door. There's an open door. I can say it again. I felt power on it. The old watchtower's crumbling, but there's an open door. Lord, we want to walk in. We want to walk in, Lord. We want to know you. We want to experience all the depths of your love. 
for union's sake, for righteousness' sake, for love's sake. We want to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. That was excellent. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I believe that, don't you? <clears throat> I'll just say at the outset, you know, <clears throat> why Amy and I are here is because we believe, the Lord has shown us, that the Lord is recruiting forerunners for the age to come. That we have crossed a timeline in the plan of God. And that something is coming. We're, we're going to use the word omega. I'm going to focus quite a bit of what I'm going to share tonight. You guys okay? Everybody's good to, for, a few, for a few hours? And that's almost what I said, but I went a few minutes. The word hours kind of rolled off of my lips, and I, 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 I can't do that either. But, but uh, anyway, if, you, if you're going to track with me for a few minutes, just 45 minutes or so concentrated focus because... May share some things that are new to you, um, but they are where we are biblically. And I may even say a couple of things that might challenge you. But as I always try to do, bi biblically, you know, ground everything we're saying. But we're in the omega time. Now I I'm going to explain that more as we go along here in just a moment. But the word omega is consummation. That's the end, the beginning, and the end. Remember that. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. The word finisher could have been translated consummator. Now we have throughout the Bible, you know, we have these prophetic scriptures that I mentioned yesterday, uh, last night or whenever that happened to be. You know, and so many scriptures dealt with the Lord's first coming. That was a big deal. The creator of the universe became a human being, lived among us, lived, died, buried, resurrected, and bought our salvation. That's a big deal. About 300 or so prophetic scriptures and events that were foreknown, predestined, prophesied by various authors, every one of them fulfilled to the letter. But now we've got 2,000 dealing with Omega time, way more even. And so we know that um, with the feasts of the, of the, of the first, the, well, the spring months, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, those were fulfilled in what we might call Alpha ministry the Lord's Alpha ministry. But now we've come to the end of the age and we're in the Omega ministry. And this is the return of the Lord, symbolized by, first, well, by trumpets, by Day of Atonement, and by the Feast of Tabernacles. Amen? You tracking with me? All right. And uh, there is a battle going on right now in the church, not just in the world. The world right now, they're just kind of pursuing wicked sinners' sin. Did you know that? Why do we condemn the world for sinning? Of course they're going to sin. They're, un they're unregenerated. They're, they're sinners. <laughs> I don't like it, but you know what? A big part of that is our problem because the Lord is waiting on us to get our act together so we can bring in the people out there and change them so they don't want to sin so much, right? That's really the, you know, let's be a little honest about it. Do you know that, that I was reading some numbers, and you know, you, you have to try to take some of these numbers with a grain of salt, but I always try to verify anything that I do on research by two or three sources, you know. But somewhere around 80 million American Christians don't even believe in the power of God. That breaks my heart, doesn't it, yours? And they will argue you. They well, believe me, I know. <laughs> That, no, God doesn't heal anymore. And they get mad about it. If you tell them, yeah, well, he does heal. You know, how do you explain what happened 50 years ago? I know people living today that would have died of cancer 50 years ago if they had not been in a Catherine Kuhlman meeting or an A.A. A. Allen meeting or a William Branham. I mean, really? Are we still arguing this? And I really get a lot of really ugly ones we both do when we start talking about visions. Oh, when the Bible sits there and says, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all mankind and your sons and daughters will see. Amen. 
Amy and I have a, a, a friend, couple, in Yuba City, California. And um, we were there a few months ago, and uh, this actually would have been a year ago. Well, not quite a year ago, December, because her birthday was while we were there. And, and so the, the ladies took her out for a birthday dinner, you know. <clears throat> and so that left Dave and I to go, just the two of us talk, you know, and we went, where did we, where did we go? The best steakhouse in town, of course. <laughs> the biggest steak you can find in Northern California. That's where we went. And so we were sitting there, and Dave was really filling me in on some things that had been going on in his life. And he was telling me, he said, you know, I, I had an interesting visit from the vice admiral of the United States Navy. A visit. A guy shows up in his office. I'm so-and-so, named his name. I won't say it. And I am the vice admiral of the United States Navy, and I am the uh, leader of a special SEAL team unit. And we investigate things and deal with things that cannot be explained. And he said, I just came from Afghanistan and I dealt with something that I can't really fully explain, but I'm told that you can help me understand what I was dealing with. And he said, well, what were you dealing with? He says, well, we were dealing with the giants of Kandahar. And my friend Dave said, giants? <laughs> Plural? Because there had been some reports circulating that, the, that some, uh, a being that was really, really big was killed, right? You may have heard of it. But here you got a vice admiral of the Navy who says, now, you know, I, I need to understand. Explain to me because Dave and his wife, Cheryl, she, by the way, is A.A. A. Allen's granddaughter. And they do a lot of deliverance. And so they got a reputation in certain circles of dealing with some strange stuff. And so he said, I understand from some of my sources, now that's a little scary, <laughs> that you can help me understand what I was dealing with. Can you explain to me Genesis chapter 6? So my friend, you know, began, and so that was just one of many things. And this, uh, this vice admiral of the Navy has had an ongoing relationship with him. They talk periodically, and he'll tell him some of the stuff unexplainable things that they go deal with. And my deal is, I thought that's what the church was supposed to do. But anyway, that's another subject. And so it strikes me, so here you've got so many supernatural events. I'm going to use some words. Shapeshifters. You know, astro projections. All kinds of curses going on. All this demonic extra, I mean, supernatural activity that's going on out there. And over here, we've got 80 million United American Christians that believe that God doesn't heal anymore and he doesn't give visions anymore and he doesn't do supernatural stuff anymore. And there is the conflict that we're facing today. Well, on the other hand, the Bible tells us that we've moved into the Omega Cycle. If you'll remember... In Matthew chapter 24, you know, <clears throat> we sometimes really kind of misunderstand the scenario of that last week of the Lord. I mean, so much went on in that seven-day period, the very last week of the Lord's life. So he comes in on what we call the triumphant entry, remember? Comes riding in on a donkey, and everybody is celebrating, throwing out palm branches and Myrtle leaves and all these other things. Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They're celebrating. And, and most of us don't really understand that because we're like, why? What, what, you know, what made them do that? Because, you know, the scenario was the Lord had done amazing things. They all knew that. He had raised the dead. He had, he had healed the sick. He had multiplied bread and fish. But when he came riding in on the donkey... That was a trigger because all of the Jewish people of the day knew the prophecies of Zechariah. That our Messiah will come riding in on a donkey. Remember that? But most people don't know the verse that follows that. He's going to come riding in on a donkey and he's going to deal with the enemies of Israel. And they thought, it's here. The kingdom is here. He's about to kick Rome out of our land. 
He's going to restore the kingdom the way it was in the days of Solomon. He's going to restore the glory of Solomon's temple. We're going, you know, that was what they were thinking. And the Lord gets off his donkey and he runs down to the temple and overturns the money changers' tables and starts rebuking everybody. Scribes and Pharisees and all these and the lawyers and all the folks just rebuking them, you know, just chastising everybody. And I'm sure the disciples are kind of reeling like, this wasn't how we pictured this, you know. And, you know, and so after the Lord rebukes them and, he, and Peter, James, John, and Andrew, the four, you know, so they, they pull him aside. It doesn't say that in Matthew. It says it in another one of the stories. I, I guess it would be in Mark. Uh, they, so Peter, James, John, and Andrew pull the Lord aside <laughs> and say, Let, let's have a little conversation here, you know, a little private. It says they pulled him away privately. And I'm sure they said something like this, Lord, it, it's just us boys here, you know. <laughs> Tell us what the heck you're doing. Tell us about the signs of the end of the age, of your coming and the end of the age, right? T Tell us. What is the sign of your coming? The word there is parousia. A very unique Greek word. What is the sign of your presence coming and of the end of the ion? Age or the consummation. What is the indication? What will be the signs of your omega ministry? The consummation, the grand finale, the fruition, the fullness of everything you're going to do. And if you read the Bible, as we all do, we all know that, you know, these paradigms that are given to us, there is the former rain and the latter rain, right? The former rain is one measure. The latter rain is seven times greater. There is the glory of the latter house, but the glory of the, of the former house, the glory of the latter house is greater. That everything the Lord does is greater in the consummation than it was in the beginning. Amen? I want to hear an amen for that, if you believe that. Because a lot of people in the church don't. They want to, you know, believe that the greatest days are behind us. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Is the, is the Lord going to let the devil have the last word? Is he not, you know? Now, here's the thing. I'm going to get back to Omega. Um, but this is part of Omega, but <clears throat> I, wanna, I, won't, I actually have some notes here. I'm going to try to get to them in a minute. 45 minutes from now, I'll get to point number one on my notes. <laughs> but this is where we are, friends. The Lord is recruiting somebody. I want to go back to what I said when I first... He's looking for someone whose heart is completely his, that he may strongly support them. Will he find it right here in this room? Will he find a church that he can use to do the Omega stuff? Will he find leaders that he can put a forerunner's anointing on to begin to introduce things that have never been seen before. Now, the angelic just came in. To prophesy things that have never been prophesied before. To share things that eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, which has not yet even entered in the heart of man. Is he going to find that right here? He's looking for that because we're not going to do what we've been doing. Everyone agree with that? That's done. It hasn't worked. So now we've got to somehow let someone lead us into the Omega cycle of God. Into the fresh dimension, things which we haven't even seen before. Why have we not seen them? Because they're in the heart of God. They're, they're hidden away in the very heart of God. And someone is going to have to be supernatural to access the unseen realm. Now everything I'm telling you is in the Bible. Everything I just shared with you, you can support with 1 Corinthians chapter 2 alone. Not to mention the fact that the overcomers eat of the hidden manna, which is in God, right? Not to mention the fact that we are told that the things that were once sealed will now be revealed in the day of Omega when the Lord comes from heaven to earth, sets his feet on the land and the sea like pillars of fire, and offers the, um, the now unsealed book to a community of forerunners that will prophesy what's never been prophesied before. That's in your Bible. That's Revelation 10. Agreed? Sealed in the days of Daniel. Daniel, you know, Gabriel came to him, pretty high-level revelation. I'm going to show you something. It's going to be one of the most fantastic revelations you've ever seen in your lifetime. 
That's the good news. The bad news is you're not going to live to see it. So seal these revelations up because they are for the end time. It literally says time of the end at the time of the resurrection. It says so in Daniel 12. At the time immediately prior to the resurrection of the dead, there will be a release of prophecy that's never been spoken on the earth before by a community of forerunners that have been foreknown, predestined, and prepared with a unique forerunner's anointing placed upon their life. And they're not religious, and they're going to believe every word God says. That's right. There won't be any unbelief in them. Do you know unbelief will get you killed? You mean to support that one with a Bible verse? How about Jude chapter 1? Of course, chapter 1, verse 5. <laughs> Jude talking. Now I desire to remind you, though you all know this, that once and for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Unbelief is a horrible sin. And it will disqualify a people. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. So here we are. We're coming into this omega cycle, this consummation, this grand finale. And what is part of the omega cycle? Well, I named, uh, I mentioned last evening about, set, well, not about, I, I mentioned seven events, seven biblical events that are a part of this omega cycle. Ministry, You know, I, I, I started out, you know, in Matthew chapter 24 with the four disciples, you know. The, the, they pull the Lord aside. Okay, what, is this, what does this mean? What are you doing? Give us the sign of your coming, the parousia, and of the end of the age. The word, a, the word there, some, the King James unfortunately translates that world. And so people think, oh, what's the end of the world? And they picture planet Earth, you know, being annihilated. No, it's the end of a cycle of time. The word there is ion. Okay, you tracking with me? An ion is, a, is an interval of time. It had a beginning, it has an end, but, it, but then you transition into another age. It's not the end of the cosmos. It's not the end of, of existence. It's not the end of the world as we know it. It's just the transition of one cycle of time into the next cycle of time. You tracking? All right. This is Omega. So the Lord gave us a pretty big hint in Luke chapter 20 when the Sadducees came to the Lord and they were trying to trick the creator of the universe who had all wisdom and knowledge <laughs> and the source of all knowledge. Yeah, good luck with that one. But you remember the story, you know, okay, we got you now. You know, you believe in the resurrection. Okay, what a man, a man you know, marries a wife and he dies and and she has to marry the brother, and that brother dies, and that brother dies. She's married seven brothers. Rabbi, you know, you can hear the sarcasm in their voice, right? So whose wife will she be in the, in the resurrection? See? In the resurrection. Now, they understood the fact that the resurrection had been prophesied throughout the Old Testament. There was a resurrection. Daniel prophesied it, right? And so Jesus answers the question. He says, well, number one, you don't really understand the resurrection because it won't really matter then. Because in this age, in this ion, we, are, we marry and are given in marriage. But after the resurrection, in the age to come, you're immortal. Those that are qualified. You can't even die. Those that are joined with Christ. He said so. You're sons of God and sons of the resurrection. And you cannot even die in the age to come. Think about that. Now, that's true of the people that are, that he says, those that are worthy to attain. Now, multiple points here. Number one, so Jesus acknowledges the coming of the end of this age, right? In the next age. You see that? You can read it for yourself. I could turn to it, but for the sake of time, let me just quote it. That's Luke chapter 20, beginning at verse 35. So he's talking about this age, in this age, in this ion, in this span of time that we have been in, you know, from, for 2,000 years now. 
when, when this age comes to an end, it's marked by the resurrection. The resurrection of the dead is the ending of this age. You see that. All right? Now, that's not the only place it's mentioned there. It's mentioned also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and other places as well. So, when, so we're in this age until the resurrection. So the Omega time cycle is the very last generation that's on the earth leading up to the resurrection of the dead. Then you have the next age, which we call the kingdom age. Now, in the Old Testament, it was called the day of the Lord, that span of time transitioning out of the old age into the new, right? You still tracking with me? Am I going too deep? Okay. My wife gave me a thumbs up. She's my barometer. <laughs> She's like, you're doing good. Everybody's with you. So this age is coming to an end, and there's one generation on the earth during that cycle of time. Do you agree with it? You're it. Now, how, how do I know that? Because the Bible says when you see the fig tree putting forth her buds, you know the end has come. Every scholar, even the ones that don't believe in the supernatural, acknowledge that's the restoration of Israel. That happened in 1948. And that generation will not pass away before these things are fulfilled. That's just one of many promises. Joel chapter 2, I mentioned it last night. After this, I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. After what? After the land of Israel that was a barren desert is restored to a flourishing garden. When you see fig trees and olive trees and all the, the promises that are mentioned there, then I'm going, but before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So you see a span of time again, right? After Israel's restored, that's one marker, but before the great and terrible day of the Lord, when the Lord judges everything on the earth, this wicked, in that span of time, I'm going to pour my spirit out and all the good stuff's going to happen. Why? Why? Why is the Lord going to have one final display of glory? Because he says in Matthew 24, this gospel the one he preached, <laughs> will go all over the whole world. Then the end will come. Why? There will be one final witness on planet earth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody on the planet will be given the opportunity to accept or reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you reject it, what's coming? The day of the Lord? It's not, it's not going to be a good day to be on God's bad side. <laughs> it's not going to be a good day to be in wickedness and unrighteousness. It just didn't. You can sugarcoat it all you want to. But I can give you 45 verses off the top of my head that talk about the Lord's dealings with unrighteousness and wickedness and wicked men. Read 2 Peter chapters 2 and 3 before you go to bed tonight. Well, probably not before you go to bed because you may not, you may not have good dreams. Maybe you better wake up in the morning when your brain is fresh. If Peter were to stand here tonight or any pulpit in the West and preach 2 Peter chapter 2 and 3, he would be hooted out of the pulpit. But yet it's in the Bible. And so what's our responsibility, Johnny? The Lord is looking for someone or some community of people to display his glory. Darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness of people. But the glory of the Lord is going to be risen upon them and every, upon his people, and everyone will be given an opportunity to accept or reject the Lord. And if you reject it, now, think about the first century, the Alpha ministry. The creator of the universe walked the earth in human form. <laughs> Can it get any better than that? And he allowed them to beat him and smite him, and pull out his beard, and scourge him, and all. He, he allowed it. That was part of the plan. They won't be doing that the second time around. He's coming in glory. He's coming in power and majesty, and just look at that description you see in Revelation chapter 1, when John, this beloved disciple, saw the Lord <laughs> as the supreme king, and ultimate judge of all creation with eyes like flames of fire face shining like the brightness of the sun at noonday his hair 
like white as wool, like snow, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, had a white robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash across his chest, and his feet look like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. <laughs> you won't be smiting that guy. But the whole world will have an opportunity before the Lord returns. And when he starts to judge the nations, nobody's going to be able to say, oh, if I'd only known. What happened to Israel after they rejected their Messiah? The whole city was turned upside down. Over a million Jewish people died horrible, excruciating deaths. The temple was destroyed. And all of Israel was scattered for 2,000 years because they rejected their Messiah. They said one of the most horrible things in all the Bible. The leaders of Israel, when they were standing before Pontius Pilate, said, let his blood be on us and our children. The worst thing that could have ever been spoken. But the Lord will forgive that in the end. He will forgive it. So what is the Omega ministry? You know, there are seven events. Let me go ahead and say them very quickly. If you want to jot them down, you can. But we have some material on our app. Uh, we, we have, yeah, if you guys can put up the, the little graphic, if you have it back there with the, because um, I'm going to share some things very quickly. But these notes can be found on our app if you want to get them. But there's seven future events that are part of Omega, okay? You're being recruited as a forerunner to this new season of the Spirit, the Omega ministry and the Omega prayers and the Omega leaders. That's my term, but I believe you can support all of this with the Bible. There are seven future things that, that are part of this Omega manifestation of God, the resurrection of the dead and the translation of the living saints, all right? That's number one. Now, that's a big deal. That's a big part of the Bible. Do you realize in, in the West, we don't talk about the resurrection very much? You hardly ever. Now, my, our table group have heard me talk about it a lot. But the resurrection was a central theme in the early church. In fact, I, um, oh my goodness, this after nine. I did a lot of research, you know, um, in, in the conversation of the early church. I went back and I found a couple of guys that have spent their whole life, you know, studying uh, the Apocrypha and the writings of the early church fathers. And there was one in particular that we like a lot. His name was Irenaeus. He lived in the, in the, the second century, but he was a disciple of a man by the name of Polycarp. Now, Polycarp had been, this, had been mentored, if that's the right word, by John the Beloved. So John the Beloved you know, mentored this man Polycarp, who then mentored this man Irenaeus. And so he wrote a five-volume five book called Against Heresies. Very thick, <laughs> thousands of pages. And so we have a pretty good little snapshot of life in the early church. And one of the things we know about the communication, one of the central themes of the early church fathers, not just Irenaeus, but many of them was the resurrection of the dead. That was a big part of it. They thought they were living in this time of tribulation that the Lord spoke about in Matthew 24. They, they thought, well, you know what? You know, Nero must be the Antichrist <laughs> because he's killing the apostles and he's, you know, crucifying Christians and all the horrible things that were going on. And so they talked about the resurrection of the dead a lot. In fact, for the first 300 years of church history, the conversation of the resurrection was a big part of it. It only got away from the conversation when the church became organized in Rome in 325 A.D. And they actually tried to destroy the writings of the early church fathers because they were so contrary to the traditional teachings of this organized institution that preached another Jesus, another gospel by another spirit. So let me give you the seven things. The first is the resurrection slash catching away of the living saints. But a part of that is the perfecting of the bride Revelation 19, right? The bride making herself ready. And also the empowerment of the sons of the kingdom to do the works Jesus did and even greater works. That has to happen. That's Romans chapter 8, right? There has to be 
this manifestation of sons of God that do the stuff before the end comes. And that leads us up to the resurrection of the dead, translation of the living saints. Now, a lot of people call that rapture, which I don't, I don't use that word much because the word rapture means so many different things to so many different people, right? What I, what I mean by that is, you know, when the resurrection happens, not all of us are going to be dead. You know, Paul had to deal with this. In the book of Thessalonians, you know, he went there and the first time and talked about the resurrection he sold them on it. We want to be a part of the resurrection. The only problem is we're not all dead. Do I need to go out and get run over by a chariot real quick so I can be a part of the resurrection? You know? He said, no, 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 no. You know, the Lord's got that covered. This is a mystery. Can't you just hear that in the, you're not going to all die. Somebody's going to be alive when the Lord comes. And those guys, they're going to make it too, but they're going to be changed in a moment of time. They'll be translated. Caught up with everybody else. So the dead in Christ will be raised first. Those that happen to be alive, they're right on the heels of that, coming up too, right? So that's the resurrection translation of the living saints to meet the Lord in the air. That's the coming of the Lord. Following that, you have the judgment seat of Christ. So let me give this seven, and I'll come back. I know myself, and if I don't go ahead and just give them to you, I'll do three of them and forget the rest. The resurrection of the dead, the translation of the living saints, number one. The judgment seat of Christ, number two. The great tribulation, number three. The return of Christ on the white horse, number four. The millennial reign of Christ. The great white throne judgment. And the new heaven and the new earth. Okay? That's Omega. That's the end. This is the big deal. This is what Enoch saw. This is what Abraham saw. This is what the prophets prophesied about. Not just a little bit. 2,000 scriptures worth. 2,000 predictive prophetic scriptures talking about this cycle of time. And so many of the people of the past longed to be a part of it. But God didn't allow them to. But he did you. Think about that. Think about that. And what we do know about the Omega cycle is that what we have done in the past to prepare people will not work. There is a new way of praying called the Omega Prayer. There is a new way of doing, a different way of doing ministry. Now, it doesn't mean the principles of the kingdom we do away with. But we know how we prophesy, how we train. Would you like me to give you an example? We did a, a prayer school, Amy and I did, a couple of, couple of cycles, and there are people in this room that were part of it. And so when I went to the Lord, I said, Lord, I, I would like to know <laughs> myself. What, give me, give me a, a, a model, you know, of what this is going to look like. And I was immediately reminded of something that, uh, that, that um, my friend Bob Jones, you know, shared with me when I first met him. Bob, you know, I didn't initiate this relationship. Bob Jones, if you don't know, happened to be a prophet. He's in heaven now. He died on... Valentine's Day 2014. Um, Bob was very instrumental in prophesying what is now IHOP in Kansas City. He was a very central prophetic voice in the buildings. They would, I mean, just so many, many things. I mean, Mike Bickle has done a really good job of honoring Bob when he shares the prophetic history of IHOP, telling all of the various supernatural things, comets coming in the heavens, earthquakes. I mean, we're not talking about little minor prophetic words. We're talking about big deal stuff. So I met Bob in 1994. <clears throat> Bobby Connor calls me up and says, we're supposed to host a conference with Bob Jones. Do you know how to reach him? I said, I don't, but um, I've heard his name, but I don't really know him. And so long story short, we uh, host an event in Texas <clears throat> with Bob Jones. And I met him that day, and I thought, this is the strangest man I have ever met in my life. And I knew him for 20-something years, and I never changed my mind. <laughs> true. That's a true story. Uh, and I'll, I'll lighten it up a little bit. I don't want to wear you out tonight, but I'll lighten what I've been doing and i tell you a story. We were sitting there, and we went to this restaurant that where you throw the peanut holes on the floor. First time I've ever been to one of those, you know. <clears throat> and it was just liberating. Eat your peanuts and just, man, that felt so good. 
And so we, um, you know, of course, I found out later, but Bob loved his fried chicken, you know. And so he's sitting directly across the table from me, and I'm sitting here. And, and in Texas, everything's big, right? That's true. So he had this big old fried chicken breast in his left hand. And he had this big knife in his right hand. And he's kept looking at me. This is a true story. I'm not exaggerating it. And he's talking about people living below God's best. And he's looking at me. And, and, he, and he says, you know, it's a, he took the chicken breast and he, you know, and he's sitting right, and he shakes it in my face. It's a sin for people to live below God's best. And, he, and he's talking like that, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's true. It's a sin to live below God's best. He said, don't you worry about pride. God knows how to bust your bubble. And he stuck that knife in, that knife in my face. He knows how to bust your bubble. Oh, oh my Lord, what, in the, what have I gotten into? That was in May of 1994. So early June, my phone rings. And um, true story, I'm not exaggerating any portion of this. So I, I, I pick up, I say, hello. He said, this is Bob Jones. I said, hello, Mr. Jones. He said, don't ever call me Mr. Jones ever again. I said, okay. I said, hello, Bob. He said, listen, I'm going to be at your place Friday about 5 o'clock. I'm going to stay till probably Sunday about 5 o'clock. I'll see you then. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> so he didn't ask if I was going to be there. <laughs> sure enough, 5 o'clock Friday afternoon, exactly. A, a red pickup truck comes pulling in. All right. So he gets out of the red pickup truck. He has a little satchel. Just can I pick this up? No, this satchel here. He has one little satchel, like just a, just like this, but black, and a and a gallon jug of water. And he comes walking in with his gallon jug of water in his left hand, and his little satchel in his right hand. And he's walking back to our to my condo. And I, I said, uh, Well, Bob, you me get your suitcase for you. He said, This is it. I said, okay. I said, uh, you're going to be here for three days. He said, yep, this is it. I got my razor and my shirt in there and my toothbrush. Now, this is going to be way too much information. So I said, well, what about your undergarment? He said, oh, I don't wear underwear like that. I'm like, oh, okay. This is going to be an interesting weekend. So he comes in, stays from Friday to Sunday with an electric razor, a toothbrush, and one shirt. <laughs> True story. True story. I could go further, but I won't. <laughs> That's a true story. So anyway, one of the first things he said to me that weekend, because he was puzzled, he said, he said uh, the Lord told me just a few weeks earlier that he is going to use a man to, uh, to lead a revival in Canada and that his name would be in Romans 4.17. He said, can you help me find a man's name there? And so I got out every, and I had all these books. I had a library, you know. At that point, I was reading everything. And I looked every concordance, every trend. And there was no man's name anywhere in Romans 4.17. I said, Bob, it's just not a man's name. Are you sure you heard from the Lord? He said, I know. I saw it in a vision. The Lord said the man's name is in Romans 4.17, but I can't find it. And within, I don't know, just a week or two later, the outpouring, and he said it's going to be in the land of the chickadee above Toronto. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what a chickadee is, but okay, whatever you say. <laughs> sure enough, the outpouring of the Spirit comes, and we found the man's name, calling those things that are not as though they were. True story. Now for me, and I, I'll tell you what that meant for me, is when a lot of criticism came about that, I knew, no. God pulled that one off because nobody can make that up. You know, I'm going to use a man and his name is Arnot. I call him those things that are not as though they were. So I knew that at the heart of that, Toronto was God. That was number one. Number two, he, he told me multiple times, this is one of the things about Bob. He will tell you a story and you're like, okay, I'm not going to forget this. You know, the angel came or this happened. And then a week later, he'll tell you the same story as though you'd never heard it before. And I just let him tell it four, five, six, seven times. And finally I said, Bob, I'm telling that story better than you. So, so you don't need to, t 
but he'll tell you all over again like you never heard it. So here's, the, here's what happened. He was telling me that in the early 80s, an angel, a very specific angel, would come to him and tell him, July 3rd, the Lord is going to come, and you're going to have a face-to-face -face with the Lord. July 3rd of that year came, and nothing happened following year comes and the angel comes again July 3rd and you're going to have a face to face with the Lord that's a big deal I mean, that's not some little small little you know revelation and July 3rd that year came and went nothing happened and now I can't remember if it was the third or fourth year but somewhere the third or fourth year the angel came and said July 3rd the Lord is going to come you're going to have a face to face with him and this is the year Get your questions ready. The angel told Bob, get your questions ready because you're going to have a face-to-face. -face. Bob told me this story so many times. So July 3rd rolls around, and he's um, on his porch. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, just number one, he's thinking, when is the Lord going to show up? He stuck around his house all day, didn't go anywhere. The Lord's coming from somewhere. I don't know where, but he said, today is the day. The angel said so. And he, he began to think, well, what questions do I ask the creator of the universe? And he made up his mind. He said, Lord, you know, he's, to himself, he said, I'm, I'm not going to ask my questions. I'm going to just say, Lord, I just want to hear whatever it is you have to say to me. Three o'clock in the afternoon, he's sitting out on his porch. And all of a sudden, a bright light shines right inside the porch. And out of the light, the Lord stood. And this is the part where Bob was so, you know, um, moved, all of us would be. And the Lord walked over to him and took him by the hands and said, my dear friend, I have so looked forward to this visit. Can you imagine the creator of the universe calling you as his dear friend? And the Lord began to talk to him and tell him some things about what was to come and what is now I have. He spoke to him out of Amos chapter 9 about the tabernacle of David, shared with him. You know, this is 83, I believe was the year, maybe 84, 83, 84. Before, you know, all this happened, I think he met Mike Bickle in 1983 and uh, went to Mike with a lot of these revelations. And Mike, you know, was like, I, I don't believe a word you're saying. I think Mike even talks about this in their history. Well, the Lord told him he was going to lead a worldwide prayer movement, and Mike went, no, I'm not. You know, he's, he said, I'm going to lead a little, I got a little I'm pastoring a little church here. <laughs> I'm not going to be leading a worldwide prayer movement. And Bob said, oh, yeah, you will. And I guess I could go into a lot of details. So the Lord says to Bob, you can ask your questions now. And Bob said, Lord, I, I don't really want to ask you questions. I want you to just tell me what it is you want me to know. Now here's where we get into the prayer model. This is the model. But this happened to Bob. I know it. He told me so many times. The Lord said, okay, Bob. He said, I want you to pray that I would release on the earth my dread champions. I want you to pray Psalm 12, 1 and Psalm 89, whatever the verse was, about David's dread champions. And so Bob said, okay, Lord, I, I pray that you would release on the earth your dread champions. And the Lord says, now, I want you to pray that their faith would fail not and that I would remove from them unbelief. So Bob prayed back to the Lord, Lord, I pray that their faith would fail not and that you would remove from them all parts, portions of unbelief. And the Lord looked at him again and the Lord says, now, Pray for me that I'll give them power. And so, and again, he gave him the scripture, you know, Acts 1-8. You'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and so forth. And so the, Bob prayed back to the Lord. And this is what was funny. Because the Lord said, Bob said, <laughs> the Lord looked at him like, okay, I will answer that prayer. And we're like, well, yes, it was your prayer. <laughs> now, I mean, it's like the Lord heard the prayer, I will answer that prayer. That's the prayer model of Omega. Now, not all of us are going to have the Lord come stand in front of us. 
But right now, we're just like, Lord, we do this or do this or do this. We're praying this broad range of prayers as though we're groping around trying to find the will of God. In fact, we're actually praying more to discover the will of God than we are to pray that the will of God be released. Do you understand what? The Omega prayer is the Lord releases to you what he already wants. You remember the commissioning that I told you this, the earlier about the Apostle Paul where he says, you're going to know his will. They'll see the righteous one. You'll hear utterances from his lips. Then you'll be a testifier of what you have seen and heard. That's the model. Now, not all of us are going to have an open vision or a physical visitation from the Lord, but we can have an anointing on us where the Lord reveals his heart. Pray this in agreement with me. That's the Omega prayer. Pray this. Announce this. Declare this. Decree this. You're not looking to find what the will of God is. You know what it is. It is revealed to you by the Spirit. You're going to access in this omega model, the unseen realm, and then pray back to the Lord. Let me give you 14 things. Now, I'm not going to be here till 10 o'clock, I promise. Now, this can be found on our app, but if you have a jot, you, you can jot them down. This is part of the omega model. But number one, Bob's three-point prayer initiative. And from 1984, point number two, pray against deception. Matthew 24, the Lord warned us in the last days there will be great deception. Number three, pray breaking the power of the Laodicean spirit. Breaking the power of apathy and lethargy will be part of this Omega prayer cycle. Number four, the unity of the faith, the true knowledge of God, and for a mature man coming to the fullness of the stature of Christ. That is an omega objective. You understand that? He says, after you have apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, until, what's on the other side of until? Omega ministry. The unity of the faith, the true knowledge of God, and the fullness that belongs to the stature of Christ. That was number four. Number five, the separation of the wheat and the tares. Number six, the making ready of the bride of Christ. Number seven, calling out the overcoming priests and kings who will be prepared to rule and reign on planet Earth. How many, how many conferences have we had on that subject? Training to be a ruler and a reign, to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. What it means to function as a priest and as a king. A priest is anointed. A king has a scepter of authority. A priest ministers to the Lord. And when you minister to the Lord, you know, in a vertical way, you come out of that then delegating the authority you obtain as a priest. Pro proclaiming, prophesying, speaking. This is one reason the Omega ministry will be so prophetic in nature. Because you're prophesying. You're declaring, you're decreeing. I had this experience, and and I know some of um, you know some of you guys that follow us have heard me share it. I'll be very quick. But one time I, uh, you know, received a revelation that you know I felt pretty good. You know, I love my my nature. I love to get a revelation that I've never read somebody else preach, or that I've never read in a book. You know, that's just that's just me. I, I like that. I've never been accused of plagiarism. <laughs> People might look at me funny, but they, you know, they haven't accused us of plagiarism. But I love to get, and so I had gotten this download of a revelation, and I'm thinking in my heart, I'm thinking, wow, I must have gone behind the veil. I must have somehow gotten in the presence of God, and I went into an open vision. And right in front of me, I saw a little small statured lady, elderly. Now, I know that's relative nowadays. <laughs> because I'm not as young as I used to be. But anyway, she was elderly to me. And I saw her go into her prayer closet. And it literally looked like a closet. And I watched as she began to pray, the heavens rattled. They, verb they reverberated. And she shot out of her body. And I saw the Lord standing in heaven. And she came and stood before the Lord. And the Lord extended her scepter. And this is my vision. I'm watching this like in a panorama in front of me. And the Lord extended his scepter, and she received that revelation from the Lord, the one that I thought I had gotten. <laughs> and I watched her come back down out of heaven and back into her body, and right there by herself in her closet, she didn't pray for that revelation. She released it. 
She released it, and I watched. This is, you know, can only happen in a vision. But I watched her words come out of her mouth like a radio signal. And the words came out of her mouth like a signal, and it covered the whole earth instantaneously. It went into the spirit and the whole earth. That, that revelation was circulating in the realm of the spirit in the whole earth. And then I watched myself <laughs> in my vision. I'm, I watched myself go pray. Now, this is going to sound strange. But I'm praying, and I'm watching myself praying, and I watched myself put up my antenna. It's like I had an antenna that went up. <laughs> and I tuned in to her revelation. And I thought I had received it, but I saw the mechanics of heaven. She got the revelation, but she prophesied it into the, into the realm of the Spirit. And then I watched over in South Africa. I could see the globe, and this guy down in South Africa got it at the same time, and another guy over in New Zealand, he got it at the same time, and maybe somebody up in Canada, but I only saw those two. But I saw, I saw those two plays, and we were all began to prophesy them at the same time. But who got the revelation? She did. But what was the Omega prayer? She didn't go up and say, Lord, I'm going to pray for your will. No, she agreed with heaven because she received the revelation. And she declared it. Now, that changes everything. I realize I can go in my room at home and prophesy something under the anointing, and it goes into the realm of the Spirit. Now, my wife read the Scripture to you just a while ago. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 16. I've put a word in your mouth, and I've covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens, to found the earth, and to say to Zion, you're my people. That's the model for harvest. That's the Omega model. The Lord putting a word in our mouth, we decree it, declare it, prophesy it from a realm of, of the anointing, and it changes the heavens. You getting tired? Okay, all right. Let me finish these, and, and I will uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up. That was number seven. Number eight, coming into agreement with the biblical narrative of the last days. Give me five more minutes here. <laughs> I, you know, coming into agreement with the biblical narrative of the last days. When I was thinking about how to address it, this is, these are the things the Lord gave me, you know, several months ago. And I said, Lord, help, help me to, to know how to, how to declare that. And, and the Lord, I think, gave me a little quickened thought process. So just imagine this. The Lord, you know, he's got his boys, his disciples, you know. He's, he's coming to the end of his life. And, you know, he knows the cross is coming. And he, he sets the boys down and he says, listen, I'm, I'm going to be going to the cross. I'm going to die. They're going to persecute me. They're going to spite me. They're going to spit on me. And they're going to kill me. And what if the disciple says, no. That's not that we're going to we're going to have a 24 hour prayer meeting. We're going to go out and we're going to find everybody that you've healed, everybody that you have multiplied bread. We're going to bring them all together and we're going to pray against that because that can't be the will of God. Right. You're, there's no way you're the Messiah. You're the living God. You're not going to die. So we're going to have a prayer meeting and we're going to pray and fast until that's broken. Would that have been the narrative of the first coming of Christ? They could have prayed till they were purple and it would have made no difference because they were not praying according to the narrative of the scriptures. Now, translate that over to today. What if we are praying amiss because we don't understand the narrative of the last days? There are people out there teaching that we're already in the kingdom. I've been in communication with some of them this week. This week. And I'm not talking about people that, you know, that don't have influence. They have huge followings in the church. And one of the, one of the people, <clears throat> um, my, my position now is, and I, I'm going to rush. I, I, I can feel you. You're tired. But my position now is, you know what? I just want to preach what I believe. And whoever wants to come along, praise the Lord. We'll do this journey together. But if somebody's preaching something else over there, I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm just not going to, I don't want to be critical and I sure don't feel like debating. I'm too old to debate now. 
maybe 30 years ago, maybe so. I had a, I had a minister friend that was saying something that was obviously wrong. And, you know, I'm, and back then, this was in the 90s, you know, and I got pretty feisty. And so we were arguing back in the He called it a debate. I called it an argument. <laughs> and so I'm, I wasn't quite as thankful. to him. I said, listen, we'll go outside. <laughs> we'll work this out old school if you want to. I was mad. So I, those days are over. I don't, I don't do that anymore. So my, my deal is let's just I preach what we believe and if people want to come along, praise the Lord. But every once in a while, the Lord says, no, you can't let this lie. And someone posted something that said, anyone that's preaching the return of Christ is denying that he's already here. And something said, you can't let that one lie. So I didn't want to debate, so I talked to Amy about it. We were actually at a ball game. <laughs> I'm like, Really? And so I, I just put a, I put a response. This is someone that follows or that is a friend on Facebook. And I put a response. I said, I don't, I don't believe that's an accurate statement. I don't believe you can support that with the Bible. That's all I said. Wasn't argumentative, whatever. And, of course, you know, they got this deluge of things, you know, where people come back and have all kinds of different arguments. And so I gave scriptures for why I believe otherwise. And the point is, without going into all those details, There is a narrative being taught out there that's not biblical. And you can pray until you're worn out that we're going to enter the kingdom and display the kingdom without the return of the king, and it's not going to happen. Those praise are being prayer to miss. Do you understand what I just said? Because we're not going to enter the kingdom until what? The resurrection of the dead and our king comes with us. Why would we want to be on the earth in the kingdom without our king. That's the most glory. The, the bride says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> we want to be with you. We, we don't want to rule. I don't want to rule the earth without the king. Besides that, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that's not going to happen until after the resurrection. Luke chapter 20. I, read, I quoted it to you a while ago, right? After the resurrection of the dead, then you have the age to come. Number one. Number two, Satan is bound thrown into a pit. Satan has three levels of demise. He's going to be thrown out of heaven to the earth. He was first defeated 2,000 years ago, right? If I be lifted up, I'm going to cast him out, right? He gained the victory. He disarmed principalities and powers. But yet he left him here for 2,000 years. So we're like, well, you know, Satan's been defeated. He is, but he's still out there until the Lord takes him and puts him in prison. Isn't that, isn't that the Bible? That's, Luke, that's uh, Revelation chapter 20. All right, so he's going to be cast out of heaven to earth first. He'll be in the Antichrist. And when the Lord destroys the Antichrist, he puts the Antichrist in the lake of fire and he binds Satan with chains and puts him in the abyss for 1,000 years. That's in your Bible. Plain as day. That's not a metaphor. That is just a reality, a fact. Then he comes back with his bride and rules planet earth for 1,000 years. Because his true bride wants to be where he is. We're like, you know, if you're in heaven, we'd like to be in heaven there with you. But, you know, we'll do what we have to do until then. So the point is we can pray. But if we're not praying according to the biblical narrative, those prayers are amiss. So the Lord is releasing to us a, a, a realm of revelation so that we, we are plugged in. Do you guys understand that? Sir, I just, this gentleman back here, um, you got a beard. When I said that, I just saw, felt like something was released to you, sir. Tell me what you do. The, you, the, right the, yes, sir. Yeah. Are you, are you, you're retired. Okay. Do you love Revelation? When I said that, sir, I saw something come on you. So I'm, gonna, I'm believing the Lord is going to open up some realms of understanding. Is that your wife? Uh, right to, over to this side. Okay. I want to I pray for the two of you. Something came from heaven when I said that right there. And do you, you like revelation? You love the Lord. You love the word of God, don't you? I can see that. Uh, you got a big Bible right there. Okay. Well, you're about to understand it in ways you haven't before, sir. The Lord is going to release a realm of revelation on the two of you. You're going to begin to see things you haven't seen before. 
He, you're, you're not the only one, but I saw that come right down in the middle of the room, but you're the one I caught. But I believe there's all kinds of people right now that are about to see things you've never seen before. I tell you what, I know I've got a few more things, but I feel the anointing right now. Uh, the, the Word of God is about to become living for many of you. If you have felt like the Bible is a little dull or you haven't quite really been able to understand it, stand to your feet right now. There's something for you. If, you're going, if you've been, if been in that mode where, Lord, I, I'm, I'm not really getting it the way I want to, see, this is, this is what I felt. That's when I felt like the Lord said, you can't go any further. So, Lord, I pray for every one of these. Listen, there's something in the room right now. There is a realm of authority in this room right now to awaken the, the Word of God, that it becomes living, the living Word, not the written Word only, the living Word. Where the Spirit falls on the Word and makes it become living on the inside of you. Where you receive it and you embrace it and you understand it. You connect it from one, to the, from one end to the other. From Genesis all the way to Revelation. You get the revelation of the Word. I can see it just shoot right through this direction right here. So Lord, tell every, fill every one of these with a realm of revelation. You're not going to be intimidated by the book of Revelation. You're going to love it. You're going to want to read it every day. The book of Revelation. The Revelation, the Apocalypso of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's the unveiling of his end time plan. The awakening of his bride to a place of intimacy and fellowship. Where she herself becomes an expression of the living word. We are the word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And He's coming back for a people that are the Word. They're going to be, you're going to be compatible with the Lord because you will be the Word manifested in flesh. You will be bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh. And so I release that. I can still feel the pull. It's a very powerful pull coming right through me right now to, uh, to, to everyone. Just by saying these words, I can feel the release of this revelatory realm. So, Lord, I release it in Jesus' mighty name. Bless you, man. Fill him up, Lord. Just make him a champion. Open the, the realms of understanding in his life, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Let it go right down the aisle here. Just release it to every one of these people, Lord. Realms of revelation. I won't whop you like I did him. <laughs> He's a young man. He can take it. Lord, fill him up. You guys are married? Just you know, You're holding on to each other. You better be, huh? Lord, fill him up. Fill them up. Fill them up with this realm of revelation. I want you to love the Word of God more than you love steak, more than you love, you know, apple pie. Lord, release it to these people. I ask in Jesus' mighty name. Come and fill them, every one, with realms of understanding and revelation. Lord, let it come, let it come, let it come. We're not going to be intimidated by the book of Revelation. We're going to, be, we're going to embrace it. How you doing, man? Bless him, Lord. Fill him with realms of understanding of this dimension of the Spirit. Grant that, I pray, Lord. Fill them up. Fill them, I pray. Let me get you guys. Lord, release this realm of understanding in Jesus' mighty name. Open heaven revelations, Lord, coming from, from the realm of the Spirit, accessing the unseen realm like never before to understand the realms of revelation. Grant that, Lord. I saw you too, sir. Is this your family? He's right here, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, these guys are prophecy magnets. I think every time I come here. So I just want to pray, uh, prophesy and pray over you that the word of God will become living. That's a big deal. Just say, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. The word is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the King of kings. He has on his thigh written the word, word of God. The word of God. Re release it, I pray. How you guys doing? Bless him, Lord. Bless this man. I know we, you were there. We, we prayed for you. Lord, release it, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name. I'm just trying to be very quick, but I, I, want to, I want this realm of understanding to be given to you. Bless them, Lord, all the way down this road. Fill them, I pray. How do you do? Bless them, Lord. Thank you. Bless them. Release that realm of revelation in Jesus' mighty name. How you doing, man? I'm going to put my hand right on your heart. Just that your heart will be open to the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that, I pray. Well, I got through about point seven, so 
I will do the other seven tomorrow, the Lord willing. But the Lord stopped me right there. I don't want to do any more. This is where I want us to seal it tonight. So, Lord, release a sealing of your spirit. Now, you may not have ever heard that before, but the Lord said, seal it. Seal it into your heart so that it can't be stolen. That the fowl of the air cannot come and steal these seeds from you. That the revelation would penetrate not only here, but here. Right into your belly, right into your spirit where you are changed and transformed. I'm going to go back to the word the Lord gave me at the very beginning. He's recruiting forerunners. You know, in your own heart. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say, Lord, you know what? Uh, it sounds pretty good to me. I don't have anything else to do on this earth. This world is not very appealing to me. I would love it if you would hold me by the hand and watch over me. That you would put your word in my mouth and let me prophesy that word from an atmosphere of the anointing. I would be very honored, Lord, if you would let me be a part of this army. I would promise to be humble and contrite, not arrogant or, or haughty in any way. Lord, I promise that I will pray as much as I can and I can, that I would live my life according to your word, that I would be a forerunner. And with that, Lord, I pray that these people would have courage, courage to, to tell the truth. You can't be a forerunner without being a lion-like individual, a person with a lion-like nature. Grant that, I pray. Let me pray this over you, Johnny. I know we prayed over you last night, but but uh, I, want, I want to pray over you. And you got anything too, sweetie? <clears throat> you know, you already know this. You know that you're called to be a forerunner. You've known it 20 years probably. Um, is that, isn't that true? You know that that's what you've been called to be. A pioneer, a forerunner. So I want to, the part of that, though, I wanted to release right now is that spirit and power of Elijah. That anointing that we call the spirit and power of Elijah that will make ready a people for the coming of the Lord. That anointing that brings down mountains of opposition, brings up valleys of discouragement and depression and unbelief, removes all those rocky places of false doctrine and theological error that that are so prevalent in the church today but also John I want to pray over you that you would have a spirit of awakening on you that it'll awaken people a destiny that they don't even know they have that a word would come out of your mouth that's anointed that has the the awakening of the spirit to touch that seed on the inside of people and when that word touches the seed it brings it forth and releases the life of the seed Grant that, Lord, in Jesus' name. You everything's with you. Blessing, Lord. Amen. I'm going to pray for you too, sir. Can I do that real quick? Is that your wife with you? No, you too. You both of you. Just uh, want to pray over you that the Lord will bless you. Can you take each other's hand? You mind doing that? Yeah. It's always a good excuse to take your wife's hand, right? <laughs> bless them, Lord. Do you believe what I'm sharing, brother? And so, Lord, release them and let them do it. Let them be a forerunner. Let them be a carry something in a unique way there's something unique about your presentation I, I heard you share a little bit last night but um, there is a uniqueness about the way of your constitution that, um, that sees things probably a little bit differently than the way most people see it but it's still the truth and you present things a, a little differently than maybe um, a conventional person would which praise the Lord for that and so, Lord, I just release it. I'm going to put my hand on your belly just to ask the Lord to unlock these, um, these depths uh, of his destiny and purpose, the things that he didn't even know he was called to yet. I bless the two of them together that you would release this uh, revelatory anointing on his wife as well, and she would begin to prophesy and see things in the realm of the Spirit. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Catherine, can we get you real quick? So, Lord, just overshadow the overshadowing, Catherine. The overshadowing of the Spirit of God in your life. <clears throat> and I can feel the pull. That's why I'm just I'm just pausing right now. Let the pull. I feel like there's a download going in. Um, you know, of of the things that I feel like the Lord has had us pursuing, um, coming into you. That's going to push away some of the. Um, some of the theology, the, theologies of some that he's going to, what I see him doing is really narrowing down 
into a more focused vision for what you're going to believe and what you're going to prophesy and what you're going to pursue in the realm of the spirit. A laser-like vision to, to pursue something very specific in the realm of the spirit. Grant that, Lord. Release it to Catherine. Okay. Grant it, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. Let me make sure I'm done. <laughs> You will make, can I share it now? Um, I had a vision, um, and I saw um, like about this big around beams of light, like fiery light coming on, and um, several people from the heavens straight down, like this fiery light. And I felt it um, as an establishment. And here's why I felt that. I'll take just a couple minutes to tell this quick story. Is that okay? Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Um, um, must have been 2017. Um, I went to Africa and we did tent meetings there and ministered um, there and just beautiful time, beautiful land, beautiful people. Uh, I, I love it there. Um, before I went, I had had a dream and I saw a, an African princess a certain um, fabric she was wearing. I saw that she represented the future vision of Zimbabwe. And I saw myself washing her feet with mud in the middle of the, in the, middle of the village. And um, I didn't tell anybody this dream, and there were a lot of details. And I get to a, a service. We weren't in Africa yet. This is months before we were going. And a woman comes up to me, and she tells me my entire dream, every detail. So I knew, oh, God, you're doing something. And so we went, and there's, you know, several hundred people, and they're just so lovely, and they're wanting, we're taking pictures, and they're just so beautiful. And one girl comes up, and she's another one wanting to take a picture, and the Lord speaks to me, and he says, she's the one. And he had given me in the dream a whole prophetic word for her. He said, she's the one. I said to the Lord, she's the vision, the future vision for Zimbabwe in my spirit. The Lord said, she's the one. And I said, hi, it's nice to meet you. My name is Amy. And she goes, hello, my name is Vision. <laughs> so time went on. A few days went by, and it, um, we gathered to pray over her, to prophesy and give her the word. And I got to wash her feet with mud right there in the middle of the village on a sideways chair that was barely, barely standing up. And her mom was there, and the Lord gave a prophetic word. It was actually discerning what they had gone through. And that was, in fact, some very difficult things they had gone through. And began to prophesy. And when I did, and there was a team of us around praying for her, a pillar from heaven of light like fire came straight into her, very similar to what I saw in each of you. And I knew at that point the Lord had spoken. It was an establishment, and she was filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues for the first time. Powerful tongues. And I didn't know if they were speaking in their dial, their language or tongues, but I said, I think she's speaking in tongues and later found out that was the first time. But it was a moment of divine appointment and establishment. And I felt as I saw those fiery lights, I remembered that story. I remember that experience and the establishment that was taking place for her and what she represented for her nation. And I feel a sense of that for what you all represent for this nation and an establishment in this truth that's been released this weekend.